All right, so let's get started today. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, um, depending on where you're streaming this from. My name is Shayla Sherrod, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 We Represent Conference, the Fulbright Nuts and Bolts panel. Um, you're all in for an incredible treat today. We have two incredibly diverse and knowledgeable panelists who will speak not only to the nuts and bolts of the Fulbright program and application process, um, but also to their experiences as Fulbrights in their respective countries. Today, we'll hear from Janika Barrage, a 2019 Fulbright Scholar to Indonesia, who is currently working at an education-focused nonprofit organization in Washington, DC, and Taniqua Hugley, a 2017 Fulbright Scholar to Trinidad and Tobago, who currently serves as an outreach coordinator of Open Communities Alliance in Connecticut. Please feel free to submit any questions in the chat function, and I'd be happy to field them to our panelists upon completion of the presentation. Although we cannot see you all, we still want this to be very engaging and exciting. So please do not be afraid to ask any questions. This is truly for you. And without further ado, I'll have our panelists begin their presentation. Welcome everyone once again. We're really excited to have you here today for the Fulbright Nuts and Bolts panel. My name is Janika and I was a 2019-2020 English teaching assistant to Indonesia. Specifically, I was in East Kalimantan on the island of Borneo. I lived in this remote but really lively town with over 100 or so, 100,000 people or so, where I co-taught 400 plus 10th and 11th graders alongside my awesome Indonesian English teachers. Um, some of the things that I was involved in community-wise included English club for the students as well as English club for the teachers, which was always really fun. And outside of my school, I attended these weekly English community sessions where we had discussions on all kinds of topics. And um, I was able, alongside my, my site partner, we were able to host a few presentations to other people in the community, as well as a, a, a workshop for English teachers. So to say it was a great time is an understatement. So at this point, I want to pass it over to my co-host, Taniqua. Nice. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Taniqua Hugley. Um, as Shayla said, I conducted my Fulbright research in Trinidad and Tobago in the year 2017. Um, and so my research focused on um, the ways that policies impacted the lives of um, girls and um, looking at the factors that led girls to become incarcerated in the only all girls uh, juvenile facility on the island of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and so some of my, my research questions um, looked at, as I said, the, the factors um, and the types of programs and services um, that St. Jude's School for Girls provided, looking at um, whether or not these were actually identified as rehabilitative uh, programs. And um, my community engagement, I became very involved in the yoga community. Um, and I participated as one of the, the lead mentors in the Reach, Your, Reach for Your Rights um, camp at the University of West Indies in St. Augustine. Um, under the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. And then I started a, a girls a mentoring group called Trinity Girls Rock. Um, and so what we did there was uh, some empowering programs. We even started a financial literacy program, which still exists today. So um, going back to Trinidad and Tobago before COVID, but now um, just last year, we did it virtually. Um, so just, you know, ensuring that uh, some of the things that are put in place were sustainable. Um, and today I am the outreach director for Open Communities Alliance, which is a civil rights nonprofit. Um, and as you can see, there are patterns in, in my passion as far as justice, civil rights, and, and bettering the lives of um, folks of color. Um, so I'll pass it back over to Janika. I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you, Janika. So awesome. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Fulbright program. We are so excited that you want to learn a little bit more, a little bit about the Fulbright program. This was established in 1946 by Congress. It is the flagship international exchange program in the United States, and it is sponsored by the US Department of State. And there's funding provided by the US government and it's administered by the Institute of International Education. In terms of the mission of the Fulbright program, as you can probably imagine, the 
mission of the Fulbright program is to foster mutual understanding between the United States and other, nat and other nations. It's to foster intercultural um, engagement with, between us and other countries. And we are in partnership in over 160 countries or 160 countries worldwide. We offer programs for students, for faculty members, artists, journalists, lawyers, a host of um, academic and professional individuals from all backgrounds to take advantage of these really awesome opportunities to teach, to study, and to conduct research around the world. And in terms of why we're here today, <laughs> there's a reason why this, this conference has been put on. Um, something that I recognize as a Fulbright grantee is the need for more diversity in these programs. You go to other parts of the world and sometimes they're surprised to see someone like you or me um, representing the United States of America. And so it's really important that we continue to push diverse audiences to apply for these programs because you are so very much needed. And so Fulbright is committed to to diversity and inclusion. We really want to reflect the diversity of the United States in these programs. And um, as cultural ambassadors to other countries, we really want these those other countries to know that there's so much more to the United States than what they see in the media. And so we really encourage a lot of students from all kinds of backgrounds to, to apply. And so welcome, and we're happy that you're here. In terms of eligibility for the Fulbright program, it is open to graduating seniors, those of you who are currently enrolled in an undergraduate program, recent graduates, uh, graduate students if you're pursuing a master's degree, and early career professionals, including creative performers and artists or musicians. Basic eligibility requires that you are a US citizen by the application deadline and to have received a bachelor's degree by the start of the grant. So if you're graduating, then we you're, you're able to apply, obviously, because you will be receiving your bachelor's. You're not allowed to have a doctorate at the time of application. And there may also be some country specific requirements such as language requirements. So that really depends on the country that you're applying for your Fulbright grant. All right, Taniqua. Awesome, thank you. Um, and so feel free to you know drop questions in the, in the chat um, and we'll get to those at, at the end. Um, so I did a study um, a research grant and Janika did a, a ETA, an English teaching assistantship. Um, and so this kind of breaks down the two different award types. So for studying and research, there are over 950 awards uh, granted. Um, and so you spend eight to 10 months um, in that host country. Um, I had the opportunity to spend 10 months in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and so the study and research grant is, is, is done in about approximately, I think 140 countries or so. Um, and so this is just the opportunity to do independent research, um, study or arts project aboard, um, abroad, excuse me. And so that means you create, and we'll get a little bit um, more into this, but you create what your research and, and study looks like. And um, with the ETA, there are about uh, 1,250 over, excuse me, um, awards granted. Again, about you get to spend about eight to 10 months of uh, teaching students um, in that host country English. And uh, the ETA is in approximately 75 countries. Um, and as I said, you can help um, English um, in US culture, excuse me, help teach English and US culture uh, in the classroom. And so, um, before um, your, your grant um, in, in country um, and even after country, you have some amazing award benefits, but today we'll talk a little bit about um, what happens uh, pre-departure uh, and during your time um, in country. So you get a round trip to that country, Fulbright, they, they make sure that they, you know, get you off um, to, to the country safely. Um, and they don't expect you to have the money to just go off to your host country. So fortunately, um, your award covers that round trip airfare, um, a monthly stipend. Um, you, are, you cannot work during the time of your Fulbright. Um, so they provide you with this monthly stipend. Um, and it will vary depending on um, the, the cost of living where you are. Um, and you get accident and sickness uh, benefits. So, um, you know, you'll have insurance that will cover you while abroad. Um, other possible benefits uh, can be support for dependents. Um, I know um, I had some friends that did um, a Fulbright and they brought their family along with them. So that's a, that's a 
definitely a, a benefit, especially if you have a, a child, right? You can't just leave them at home. Um, you get research allowance. So there's a designated amount of monies um, that are specifically used for your research. So if you need to buy books, if you need to do um, an IRB, um, if you need, you know, specific equipment or, um, you know, access to certain journals and things of that sort. Um, tuition, depending on, uh, you know, which award you are pursuing and um, if you are going to do your Fulbright on behalf of, uh, I mean, excuse me, in pursuit of a master's degree or, or a doctorate, language les lessons, um, enhancement activities, and disability-related disability accommodations. So Fulbright, you know, they don't just send you off to your host country. They make sure that um, you, you can afford it, um, and they give you resources to ensure that your time is uh, smooth and sustainable. Um, after your time in Fulbright, um, the benefits are still coming. Um, and so I am a Fulbright um, alumni ambassador. And aside from that, um, I've seen several different benefits. Um, you have the opportunity to network with people from all who have the opportunity to go to se several different countries. So you have a Fulbright network of alumni uh, across the, the, the world for the most part. Um, uh, you have access to the State Department's alumni website and that website is amazing. Uh, there are job postings, there are networking opportunities, there are uh, various grants that you have access to. And um, I can attest to that till this day. Um, at, at the beginning of COVID, um, the State Department put out a, a grant for the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund um, for, um, for scholars to apply, not only a Fulbright scholar, but also other State Department programs to apply for, and I applied for a grant that allowed me to establish um, a girl empowerment program here in the States and I got that grant. So the benefits are like continuously coming. Um, you are eligible for 12 months of non-competitive eligibility, um, hiring st status with the federal government. So if there's a job that you see um, on the federal government website and you apply for it, um, you can also submit this, um, this letter of eligibility um, and I haven't used it yet, um, but I know that there are some folks who, who have, and it puts you in a non-competitive uh, status. Lifetime Fulbright email address, um, and if you decide to become a part of the Fulbright Association, um, which is kind of like a uh, in the college where you guys have an alumni association, there's a Fulbright Association um, in uh, various cities. So there are a ton of benefits. Um, I, again, like I said, have benefited from um, Fulbright's awards post Fulbright and definitely during uh, country, during in, my time in country. Um, and so I'll pass this over to Janika. Yes, thank you, Taniqua. So many great opportunities. And I could certainly attest to those post Fulbright opportunities as well. I didn't know that we had access to all these really important journals. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy I did my due diligence and went through the alumni page to find that. So journals, they're really expensive to access. And if you're not in school and you're not connected to a library, it's really hard to get that kind of research. So it's really great that us as alumni, we have access to those. So in terms of the English teaching assistantship, which is one of the grants of the Fulbright program, these are the, the this is how you would apply or this is what is required for applying. So with all these grants, you will be submitting basic personal data and some essays and some additional requirements as well. So the essays for the English teaching assistantship include your statement of grant purpose, which outlines exactly what you're going to do. As the grants title suggests, you're going to be an English teaching assistant in the classroom. So in that grant, you're really writing about your ability to teach, your ability to engage students in the class to work collaboratively with a co-teacher. You would bring in past experiences that would be applicable to, um, to being in a classroom. And this is where you would also explain any community projects that you might be involved in. Every country has different requirements. For some country, they really want you to have a community engagement piece uh, laid out. And so in your statement of grant purposes where you would explain what it is that you want to do outside of that classroom. So really why you're going here and what you plan to do in the country. That's what that statement of grant purpose is. And it's just one page. 
In addition to the statement of grant purpose, something that complements the statement of grant purpose is your personal statement. We had a session about this yesterday. It's really your story. Um, what is it you're hoping to, who are you? This is what you're answering in your, in your personal statement. It's filling in the gaps that, or it's providing the context for your statement of grant purpose. You know, who you are as an individual, your interests, your, your motivations, um, your future goals. So that's what that personal statement is. It's really your story. And in writing your statement of grant purpose and in writing your personal statement, you would be choosing, you know, different life experiences to fill out both those essays. You wouldn't want to repeat experiences across the two, the two statements. And so you have to think about what, it, what is it that I want to put in my personal statement and which set of life experiences do I want to put in my statement of grand purpose. So that is also one page max. In terms of reports and references, also uh, a part of that application is three references, you know, academic or professional references and a foreign language evaluation for some programs. Depending on the country that you're going to, you may need to demonstrate a certain level of a language. For me, going to Indonesia, I did not have to have a background in Indonesian. That was not necessary, but for other countries, you may have have to have a, a certain level of proficiency. So that's something that you would check on your respective country's profile on the Fulbright page. And that foreign language evaluation would be done by somebody, perhaps a faculty member at your school who can attest to your language abilities. You would also submit your official college transcripts in addition to the campus committee evaluation. So that last part, the campus committee evaluation, what typically happens is students who are applying for the Fulbright through their respective schools, they will go through what we call an on-campus interview. But don't let that interview part scare you. It really is there to help you. So there will be usually through the fellowships office or your grants office at your respective school, they will sometimes ask the students, you know, who are the faculty members that may be doing, writing your recommendation letter, or they might gather other faculty members who are perhaps familiar with the Fulbright program, and they will have a committee to quote unquote interview you about why do you want the Fulbright? Why are you choosing your country? Why are you hoping to do this kind of project? And through that, they're just really assessing your your strength, the strength of your application, they are, you know, they really want you to demonstrate what it is you're going to offer, but they're also there to help. So typically they ask of you your essays beforehand, and that's where you get a lot of feedback on your essays. Um, that has been really helpful for me. My essay is always very different by the time I leave that, that uh, campus interview. So it's also there to really help you. And at the end of that, they gather all the information from your interview and they submit an evaluation as part of your application. So that is it for the English teaching assistantship. And so for study and research, it's a little different, um, but it has some of the, the same basic um, information needed. Um, so your basic personal data, um, so your essays, so a statement of grant purpose and a personal statement. So the statement of grant purpose um, is where you kind of, you map out, right? What will your research look like? Um, and so you talk a little bit about your methodology um, and, and the ways that, you know, this, this research will benefit not only the folks in, or not only your host country, but um, the way that this research can also benefit um, the U.S. Like, what can you bring back after this this research and 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 um, and data? Excuse me. What can you bring back from this research and, and study? Um, reports and references. So there are three references. Um, I suggest uh, you know securing four. Um, they have to submit um, because you just never know. I remember one of my references literally submitted um, his letter recommendation the day before. And I really wanted him to be um, uh, one of my recommenders because I did a lot of research with him and he submitted the day before. Um, and I didn't have a backup. Um, so make sure you have a backup or, or talk to um, at least four people 
Um, and then the foreign language evaluation, as Janika said, uh, official transcripts, uh, the campus committee evaluation, like she said, um, it varies depending on your, on your institution. Um, and uh, some schools, yeah, they may have a committee for you. And then some other schools, you may be meeting with someone in your study abroad office. It completely depends. And this doesn't apply to you if you're not applying through an institution. Um, and so the study and research uh, application is a little different because we also have to submit an affiliation letter. So um, with that affiliation letter, you have to make sure there's an institution that is quote unquote sponsoring you for the most part. It can be an organization, it can be a school, it can be a company, but um, it just they have to just validate the fact that um, during the time of your research, they'll, they'll be overseeing you. So for example, my affiliate, I had two affiliates. My first one was the University of West Indies and I, um, the director, the head of that department, the chair of that department um, was my advisor. Um, however, you know, it doesn't always work out, right? Or, um, you know, they may not have the resources that you think that they may have. Um, and so I had two, two um, affiliates during my time and I spent most of my time at St. Jude's School for Girls. So I added them on as an affiliate as well, where I did most of my work. Um, and then I used the, the college university for the library, for the access to journals. And so in that affiliation letter, you want your affiliate institution to, to map out what you what they will do for you, right? So make sure you ask them, you know, whether it's access to the library, access to a computer, things of that sort, they should um, map it out. And um, they should also indicate what their expectations of you are. Um, and mine was, okay, well, at the end of Sneakwood's research, we would like for her to host a pretty much like a, a lunch and learn, and, and we want her to share data or write an op-ed or something of that sort. So um, make sure your affiliate um, includes that information. Um, and, and I'm sure some people may ask, well, how do I find an affiliate um, institution? And so the glory of the, of the Fulbright program is that you literally create this yourself, how, how you want it to be. And, and so I found um, my affiliate program through, I mean, excuse me, my affiliate organization through a few different outlets. Um, one, um, I, I said, I knew I wanted to be at a university because of the journals and then, um, and so what I did was I just contacted um, the university. The woman never got back to me. I asked a professor at my at my undergrad institution to, to contact the professor there. Then they connected me to someone. Um, so you have to be creative. Um, and then social media too, believe it or not, social media um, helped with my second affiliate institution. Art supplementary materials. So they wanna make sure you're actually an artist. So they may ask for different portfolio items and IRB approval, that's big. So if you plan to publish um, and you're working with humans, you have to submit IRB approval. Um, and so there are quite a few factors in the selection um, and it, it varies, but these are a few. So the quality and feasibility of the proposal, um, Fulbright, they wanna make sure they're not sending you to a country um, and, and you're doing something that's just not feasible or dangerous. Um, and they wanna make sure that it's worth it, right? They're investing in us. Um, academic or professional records. So they'll look to see, well, for example, like I said, I wanted my recommender to, to talk about, you know, my, my experience with research. You don't have to have experience with research, but they're looking to see how your academic and professional record relates to this project. Um, personal qualifications, language preparation, they wanna make sure that you know, you're not going to a country and you don't completely understand anything that uh, people are saying to you. Um, pre preferences or factors as established by the Fulbright, um, extent to which the candidate and the project will help advance Fulbright goals. Um, so Janika talked a little bit about that in the mission at the beginning, um, the desirability of achieving diversity, uh, which is a big one and requirements of the program in individual countries. So each country may have uh, different requirements. Um, and so this is a, a, a timeline, a rough estimate of how Fulbright usually um, works. And they have this timeline, it's interactive on the Fulbright website. So February to September, they're doing events. March, the online application opens. August to October, the campus deadlines are um, taking place. And that's, again, if you're going through your, your campus institution. Um, the national application deadline is in October, November to December, they're looking at the applications. 
uh, January, you'll get uh, notice of whether or not you're moving on to the next stage as a semifinalist. And then March to May, um, you'll hear from Fulbright about whether or not you receive uh, the grant. And so this is a, our resources uh, slide here. The Fulbright page has a ton of resources. There are always webinars. Um, they are very um, active on social media. Um, some Fulbrighters take over on the social media um, and just use the Fulbright website. Um, it's, it's very useful. And so with that, we'll take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tanikwa and Janika. Um, so our first question is, do you have to have your project planned out before you apply for the Fulbright grant? I'm gonna assume that's for me. Um, do you have to have your project planned out? Yeah, to an extent, yes. Um, like I said, you have to have your affiliate um, organization already in place. If that changes um, when you get there, that's fine. But yes, you have to have a plan. Um, you can't just go and say, yeah, I'm gonna do research on girls who are incarcerated, um, but I'll figure it out when I get there. So yeah, you have to have a plan. And that's what the, the, um, the research grant proposal is. You lay out you know, what your research would look like. So you wanna have some type of methodology and it'll change, but yes, you need to have that planned out beforehand. And if you're applying, and if that question, if you are applying for an English teaching assistant, I did mention that there's some community engagement aspect to it. But, for that, since your main goal as an English teaching assistant is to teach and to be a co-teacher with your respective English teacher in that country, the it really depends on the country how much of an emphasis they place on that community engaged learning aspect. But at that point, you do not have to have a very long community project planned out again because the teaching part is the main part of your of your grant but you should have an idea of what it is you want to join. And sometimes we get caught up on, you know, the complexities of it, but English club is a very popular one that a lot of students do. Uh, and that a lot of um, schools in the countries that you're going to expect you to do as an English teaching assistant. So an English club could be one of your projects. If there is a special talent that you have, um, you can, based your community project around that. One of my cohort members was a swimmer. Two of them were swimmers and they did swimming lessons. Another one played soccer and so she created a girls soccer team. We had someone who was really skilled in graphic design and so he um, created a club around magazines and, and digital arts. Someone else really loved creative writing so she started a creative writing club. So you could think about the talents that you have and, and that could be your community engaged project if you are thinking about it, doing a English teaching assistantship. Awesome. And just to follow up on your point, Taniqua, as, as it pertains to the research, do you have any advice for any students who might not have their methodology completely like planned out and thought out? Should they access um, some Fulbright alum who went to their country on similar projects or go to a mentor or go to a professor? Yeah. Um, and so you, it, you don't necessarily, with Fulbright, um, at least for the study research and English, even for the English assistantship, things will change, right? Things are not like, it's not gonna go 100% smooth and it's fine, right? That's kind of like the fun part of it, at least I say, it's like, you know, you just figure it out, you start, you know, um, shaping your Fulbright how you, how you want it. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't hurt to ask um, mentors for some advice. And so when I say methodology, um, Quickly, I'll give you an example. Okay, so my first three months, I plan to do X, Y, and Z. So for me, and I don't know if this is what my application was, I'm just coming up with an example. Um, the first month, I wanna first get a feel of what, what the community feels about this institution, which was the, the girls' prison that I, I, I spent time on. Um, and then the next few months, I'll interview um, neighbors and so-and-so. The next few months, I will spend at the institution and interview girls. So you have to have some type of, of, of overall plan, but you don't have to necessarily say, okay, on this day, on this day, but you, you know, you get the gist that that's just an overview. So you can't just say, yeah, I'm going to do this. However, um, in the question, I think someone said or um, said something as far as 
um, should I reach out to someone who did a project similar? Um, so one thing, one piece of advice I would say is, is I don't know if that's the right step, right? You wanna do something that someone hasn't done already, um, right? Because if other people are doing this research, what sets yours apart? And maybe if you do decide to do that, you just have to make sure you put a spin on it. What is setting your research apart from those five other people who just did research that are very similar? Awesome, thank you. And so our next question is, um, does a mentor count as a reference for your application? Sure, absolutely. A mentor can count as a reference. One of those absolutely has to be an academic reference as it should be, especially if you're applying um, while you're in school. But I know for my application, for instance, I applied for a Fulbright grant when I was a graduating senior. I did not get it at that time. So I applied six years later. And six years later, at that point, I was very disconnected from my undergraduate experience, though I had built some strong academic relationships with faculty members. So one of my references was a one of my past psychology teachers with whom I did research. Another was a faculty member at my school, but uh, she was more of a colleague for me because I had worked with her while I was a student and we worked together when I returned to my school as an admissions counselor. So she knew me more in a community engagement aspect. And then my last reference was, and probably one of my strongest ones, was my supervisor. I worked for four and a half years and I had a supervisor at that time who could really speak to my present abilities. And so certainly the point is you want a reference who could really speak to your abilities as they as they relate to the Fulbright program. So if one of those is a mentor, then I would say yes, as long as it's not a, a family member, of course, but um, that is a good option too. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Janika, I echo everything she said. Um, and, and if there's someone who, for example, like she did English, if, if she taught English to, you know, or was an English tutor um, for uh, someone in the neighborhood or, you know, um, uh, English TA in class, try to be creative and strategic about who you ask for your um, recommendations. Because as she said, you want people that can speak to, yeah, I know that she'll be great teaching kids. Um, I know that she'll be great um, working on this research project. So be strategic about who you ask for your recommendations. Absolutely, just to follow up on that, I think something that's helpful when if you are a bit apprehensive to ask for a letter of recommendation is to provide your recommender with somewhat of a framework or a toolkit that explains what you've done, who you are, what your interests are, and that'll help guide their letter writing and I think produce a much stronger uh, recommendation. Um, I love this question, but can you both elaborate on how you prepared um, to budget and how you actually, you know, budget it out and manage your money and spending abroad? Sure. Budget. That's a great word. Um, <laughs> um, so I was very fortunate that at the time that I applied for a Fulbright grant, I was a full-blown working adult. So I had an income coming in and so I had built up a savings. And I was also very fortunate that my country, Indonesia, um, had a very low cost of living. So the stipend that I did receive every month was more than enough to cover my expenses. I did not have to worry about my housing as that was provided for, to me by my, um, by my school. And I hardly, I did not reach the max of my monthly budget. Beforehand, there are things that you have to think about, um, vaccinations that you might have that you might have to get for your respective country or booster shots of vaccinations that you already have. Um, other upfront costs may include moving costs. Maybe depending on, on where you are, you might have to you might have to let go of that lease. You might have to to move to another location before you actually move to your country. And so those are some things to think about. So. Um, for me, it was a little bit easier because I had an income and my upfront costs weren't too great, but that is certainly something you want to consider before going through the process, well, as you're going through the process, but certainly something you want to consider uh, during the application process. Taniko, I don't know if you want to add or Chayla too, as you are also a grantee, but um, that was that was it for me. Yeah, I think so same like Janika, I was already working. Um, um, but as far as a budget, you want to create a budget for yourself before you leave. 
Um, don't think about that in the application process, specifically work on the application so that you can get to that step. Um, but, you know, definitely create a budget for yourself. You want to think about, you know, transportation was probably one of the biggest chunks in my, in my budget because I had to get to the facility and or the, the college every day. Um, so think about transportation. Um, you may have to pay rent, uh, you may have to pay utilities. Uh, obviously, you need to eat and things of that sort, especially if you're coming out of college, um, you may not necessarily have the, the habits of, of budgeting in that way. Um, so, you know, grant, if you were granted the opportunity to become a Fulbrighter and you receive that, that grant money, um, you definitely want to be real with yourself and leave some cushion because you never know what can happen also. So have um, extra money for, for like emergencies or if you need to move or something of that sort. Um, so budgeting, yes, you, you want to budget. <laughs> Great points. Yeah, I think just preparing and ensuring that you have somewhat of a, a guideline for yourself is the best way to ensure that you're not, you know, living over your means. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, if you are a business owner, can you still apply for the Fulbright grant? Yes. Short and sweet. Great. <laughs> Um, awesome. Thank you, Taniqua. Um, how much weight does the transcript and your grades have on the application? I'm not sure. Um, I know some people who performed well in school and got a Fulbright. I know some people who did not perform well um, in school and got, got a Fulbright. Um, it literally depends on, on um, on the rest of your application, but also if you didn't do well in, in English and you're applying to be an English teaching assistant, I don't think that's smart. As with everything, thank you, Taniqua, definitely. As with everything, your application is, it's the combination of everything together. So that's your transcript, that's your essays, that's everything else you're bringing, your recommendation letters. And so one part in particular is not necessarily singled out so much that that one part is going to eliminate you, eliminate you from the running. It's everything in combination with each other. But um, every country is different, right? And so there's certain countries that might be looking for specific qualities in their students. So who knows if they are really, really harping on the the um, transcript, for instance, as opposed to other parts, but it is really the whole application together. So if maybe your grades weren't the strongest, there's still a, a I believe there's still a minimum to apply, right? A minimum GPA? I think so. I can't, I'm not sure if well, someone can, yeah. but I can't. Yes. But what I will add is that, you know, your grades can't define you. Don't let your grades define you. But I know that also on the application, there's a portion where it says like, if you want to add anything, um, um, you know, ask for any information, use that. Like, if you feel like, you know, I, I don't want my grades to define me. I'm terrified if they look at this, you know, use that opportunity to, to add in some information. Um, if you had a tough semester and, you know, had to leave for a semester, use that opportunity in the application to, add that information, um, but your grades cannot define the rest of your, your um, you know, Fulbright application. And we've received confirmation. So there is no minimum GPA and your application is looked at holistically. Awesome, we have Katie Gaines here from the Fulbright um, program. She's happy to you know, answer your questions in the chat box. So please uh, review her replies that she'll be responding to some of the questions that you've asked our panelists. Awesome. And so for seniors in college, who might be balancing their coursework, but also looking to apply for the Fulbright program, can you maybe offer any advice on how to really, you know, uh, divide your time in between focusing on your studies, but also you know, putting the correct amount of effort into the Fulbright application? Um, it's just like, uh, it's just like if you were doing a, an assignment, right? You have to carve out time. Um, however, the reality of it is in college, we might do an assignment right before class begins, um, but full transparency, you can't do that with your Fulbright application. Like, you know, you can't write this application in a week. You can't do it in a day. Like, um, I think Janika said she went to um, her, her college institution that was, you know, assisting her with this 
Um, and she had different drafts of essays. Like you're not gonna be able to write this in, in just one, one try and, and submit. I mean, you can, however, it's really risky. So um, I, at the same way as if you are submitting a, a paper that you really wanna get a good grade on, you know, allow the time and energy in the application um, because it's tough, it's not easy, so it's tough. Absolutely. And thank you, Helen. Helen just put in the in the chat some really useful resources to help you along the journey. You should be contacting the Fulbright Program Advisor at your respective institution. That information can be found on the Fulbright website. You may use that link. They are great resources to helping you getting started early. The key is really starting early and putting off, you know, scheduling that time. Like on this day, I'm going to work on my Fulbright essay for an hour or so. Early is always the best way to, to go about it. And I definitely used my, my campus, even as an alum, I still used, I still went through my university to apply for the Fulbright program, just because of that support of having the campus community, the campus committee. They were really helpful when I was a graduating senior and they, I, I reached out to them and asked them if, you know, I was able to still use them because I wasn't enrolled in another institution. I was still able to utilize my, my campus when I applied five, six years later. And so you definitely want to reach out to these individuals early as that helps you along the way. Yeah. So I didn't apply through my um, college um, or institution because it was after, but you reach out to them. Schools love when they can brag and say, oh, we have X amount of students that apply for Fulbright, this many students uh, got it, and alumni as well. So definitely apply. Um, and, and, and going back to what Janika said about the, the campus uh, committee, um, you know, some people may be hesitant to even reach out to them, one, because they don't want to, they don't want to go through an interview, right, but it's more so for support, um, or they just feel like, oh, well, I'm five, six years out, they don't have time for me, they will make time to ensure um, that they, they can dedicate some time to look at your application and assist you. Absolutely, I my essay would not have been what it was if it weren't for the individuals on my committee. Some of them were former full writers themselves as faculty members and their feedback was invaluable. I had like email chains back and forth with a few of them just going over revisions of my essay. It was incredible to have their feedback. And they asked of me questions that I wouldn't have asked myself um, to really pull out more out of me for those statements. So please utilize your, your resources. Wonderful, wonderful. And we have one question from our audience that kind of follows up on your point uh, just then. So if you're an alum from a university with no advisor or no real kind of central research or fellowship team or department, do you have any recommendation on how to reach out to someone who can help advise you throughout your Fulbright um, application process? Yeah, most schools have, depending, but most schools have a study abroad um, office. So I would say definitely reach out to a study abroad office, see if your institution has any, you know, Fulbright or Gilman or, you know, any alumni scholars. Um, and more than likely, they have it somewhere. If it's not a current faculty member or an alumni, there's someone there to help you. Um, but definitely reach out to the study abroad office. I think that may be one of the, the key places. Um, you can also reach out to, um, if, and if you're not finding them, reach out to Fulbright. Fulbright can point you in the direction maybe with that school. Um, and you can also reach out to another school in your city. There's nothing wrong with that. Reaching out to a school in your city, seeing if they have um, a Fulbright um, advisor, uh, campus advisor on their campus. Absolutely. And that's 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 a great recommendation, Taniqua. One of the people who was in my campus interview was um, a science faculty member who also worked on grants. So take a look at the other faculty member at your institution. Perhaps some of them were former Fulbright grantees or former recipients of other competitive grants. That person could also be a great resource because they're accustomed to writing these kinds of, of applications. So that's something to also look into. Wonderful. Um, are there any limitations on which countries you can apply to and how can you find out which countries um, 
aren't really hosting full riders to, to come to their country. It's on the website. Um, all of the countries and hemispheres are, are located on the website. Um, if it's not on the website, then no, that's not an option to apply to. And those are for, for good reasons, right? Probably um, because of security or just a Fulbright program is not established there and, and you need some type of support, right? Um, so yeah, everything is on, on the website, the list of, of countries there. Janika, please feel free to add. You've got it. <laughs> Awesome. So if someone applies for the Fulbright grant and unfortunately is, you know, uh, rejected or denied from the first application cycle, um, does the Fulbright program offer feedback to that applicant? No, the Fulbright program unfortunately cannot offer feedback. As you, as you can imagine, they receive thousands of application. I think this year it was to the tune of over 11,000 applications. So they're unable to receive to provide feedback to individual um, applicants. However, it's a great opportunity to take note of what you did the last time and to try to improve for the next time. There was a six year gap between my, my two applications. And when I looked back on my first application, I said, oh, it's no wonder I didn't get, <laughs> didn't get the grant that time. I applied to a very competitive country. And while my essay was good, it was okay. Um, it wasn't anything stellar. So having that gap certainly allows you to just reflect and, and reconsider maybe the country you apply to, to get feedback from new individuals and also to take a look at um, past grant statistics to connect with alumni. The Fulbright website is really a fantastic resource. In the top right hand corner, there is a um, an alumni directory and grant statistics. Reach out to past grantees, reach out to, to um, maybe current Fulbrighters in the country that you're looking for, and maybe ask them for feedback as well since they've been through it. But um, the, the, the advice for anyone who was not selected the first time is, it's okay. It really is okay. This is such a competitive program and you never know what um, different countries are looking for. And it probably, it might not even be you. It's just the state of the application in general. Uh, and so it's a great time to reevaluate and come back strong the next time. Wonderful, wonderful. And for applicants who might apply for the Fulbright Research Grant one year, then apply for the English Teaching Grant another year, is that permissible? And does the Fulbright program frown upon that change of um, application? So, and I, I would love backup from Fulbright staff for this, but I, I believe you can apply for English um, and then do a study. Um, or research one, but I don't believe you can do a study in research and then um, do an English. However, I do know folks who did a study in research or ETA and then applied for like a master or master's or, or a doctorate. We'll see if we get any backup on that. Um, thank you for providing that to Niqua. Um, so one thing that I think is important to stress is maintaining relationships at the close of your Fulbright um, time and you're experiencing your research or stay English teaching stay. So how did you maintain those relationships after completing your Fulbright grant? Do you have advice um, for students who might join the program? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so yes, I did maintain relationships and even today, um, over time, I've been able to, um, you know, meet more people that I didn't meet during my Fulbright uh, grant period. And so um, social media helps, uh, you know, different conferences like this, um, you know, meeting up in different cities. Um, uh, we had, well, I had the, the great opportunity to have a pre-departure orientation. So during that time, we met Fulbright as we were going all over the world. Um, and so you meet a ton of people there um, and, you know, just, just making sure that just like any, you know, relationship or a networking opportunity, you make sure you keep up with people. Um, but it's great. I've, I have a ton of friends from Fulbright um, and even some Fulbright alumni ambassadors that I met after my time. Um, but the friendships are there. Um, and we all, you know, at some point probably struggled together. Uh, so especially living in another country and just trying to learn together, it's a different friendship, a very unique one. Right. Absolutely. Quickly for me, my, um, I only made an Instagram because I was 
going to Indonesia on my Fulbright grant. So that is the only Instagram I have. So most of my followers are Indonesian. So it's really great. I could share just about life in the United States. So that allows me to stay connected with my students. I'm still part of our teachers group chat in Indonesia and I'm still uh, quite close with my, my co-teacher and just help them judge a speech and storytelling competition. So it's really how much you want to stay connected. If you foster those relationships, they will be maintained. But I am certainly very much connected to my Indonesian community now. Same, agree. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tanika and Taniqua, for all that you share with us today and for speaking about your own personal experience during the Fulbright Grant. Thank you for Katie from the Fulbright Program for being here and for all the incredible questions that we've received today. Um, there will be a brief survey immediately following this panel, and the survey actually serves as a raffle ticket for the giveaways, um, including online subscriptions to various programs, games, and, and many other things. I also urge you all to stick around for the subsequent session so you can learn more about all the wonderful opportunities for international exchange. And thank you all so much for being here today.